been running late, and I thank you. I thank President Ritchie for being very flexible and flipped the two the two events. But I appreciate very much you all being patient. Uh, it's a little bit the nature of presidential campaigns that they get out of control and you find yourself running around. Uh, so I, I just wanted to hear from all of you. You've got a very impressive group here, and so just you know, tell me what you wish I knew. Mr. Speaker, I just want to introduce. Uh, Captain Mike McCauley, a former NASA astronaut, who's going to give you his take on where we're sitting in terms of uh, space today. I think it's about a 30-second speech. Uh, we're, we're a nation of leaders and explorers, always have been. And in the last few years, in my opinion, we've largely given up our leadership role in uh, human spaceflight. George Bush, in January of 2004, eight years ago this month, gave a pretty damn good speech on a new vision and a new mission for the agency. Two presidents, three NASA administrators, several OMBs, a bunch of Congress and a bunch of program managers later, we don't have a whole lot to show for it in eight years. We need consistent, steady leadership, aggressive leadership, which you've shown that you will bring to us. And uh, that's it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us your time and uh, charge on. Did the, did the mission I outlined make sense? Uh, yes, although I'd argue with you on a few things here and there, but, but it's details. Uh, the vision is more important and the steadiness, because again, um, President Bush gave a good speech, but nobody followed up on it. And again, three administrators, two presidents, and a bunch of OMBs later, we've had been down spiral development. We've been down constellation. Now we're down something else, and we had something else before that that I don't even remember. So it's been three or four major programs that have consumed enormous amounts of energy, and money and time, and here we said eight years later without a hell of a lot to show for it. I can say that now that I'm retired, of course. <laughs> Mark, please. Uh, good evening, and thanks for coming to Florida to share your vision. My name is Mark Nappy. I uh, represent the United Space Alliance and also the majority of the workforce that, it, that have lost their jobs due to this transition. And I think you conveyed a very good long-term vision. And following Mike, what I'd like to do is kind of focus on the short term and some of the more, the next level of detail that this, this uh, Space Coast, the people of the Space Coast, and certainly the workforce of the Space Coast are going to be interested in. Um, there's, a, there's a real balance that, that has to be achieved. And what I'd like to kind of throw out there for you and see if I can get your opinion on, or, or maybe you can just think about it, is, uh, is how, do you, how do you reach the proper balance in terms of these elements? The first thing is any, any schedule that gets published we know is going to get pushed to the right. Right now we're looking at returning to flight, putting people back into space by 2017. And, and history has shown that that, that that schedule will slip, and people know that. Uh, the change in policy, like Mike just said, when we come up with another change in policy, we know that that is going to result in another slip. Uh, it doesn't get through Congress quickly. But, but can I but just cut you off, Sam? <coughs> Five years from now is the schedule you think will slip. So my question would be, if we cut through all the red tape, how fast could we do it if we were serious? I, I think uh, there's... There's two things about that. I mean, your, your, your statement about cutting through the red tape, that's, a, that's, a not, that's one of the balancing acts, and that was uh, actually my next point. Human spaceflight is, is risky. It's, um, it's, it's hard, and it's dangerous. And so you have to balance that risk. And, and where we, we talk about NASA's involvement, NASA adds value to reducing that risk. The problem is they also add inefficiencies where risk is not reduced. So you've got to figure out how do you get NASA to add value, reduce that risk, characterize that risk properly so that if an accident or something does happen, you mentioned in your speech that we have to be tolerant to accidents. Well, this country is not tolerant to accidents. So we, we go beyond perfection to make sure that that doesn't happen because we know that if a mishap occurs, it means another delay and maybe a cancellation. 
So, and I didn't answer your question very well, but we have to balance that. Well, let me, I don't want to be argumentative, but I just want to understand. So, so let, let me take a radical example. If we decided to human rate the Atlas V, how long would that take? I think I would defer to the folks that, that, uh, Mark? that run the Atlas V. I can try to answer that, Mr. Speaker, although I have to tell you that I'm, I'm a political scientist, not a rocket scientist. Um, the, the Atlas V is, is the rocket bid on three of the four commercial crew uh, programs. And so uh, we would be prepared, if the program goes along according to schedule, uh, to be able to do that within three to five years. Okay, but I'm asking a different question. I understand the rhythm we're currently used to. Okay. If you were told that we had to get this done on a technical, forget the bureaucracy side, on a technical side, how long would it take to human rate the Atlas V? Six months? Nine months? I mean, if it was just an engineering problem. If it was just an engineering problem, I'll, I'll get back to you with a precise answer, but I suspect it could be accelerated significantly. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, the, you know, but what I'd like to do because Senator Altman is here and therefore trapped, um, is use him as a point of contact for these kind of questions. I mean, I want to relentlessly adopt the model of World War II, where we learn to fly B-26s off aircraft carriers in a matter of months, because we had no choice. And then everything else starts to change the rhythm, and it's amazing how much you start getting done. Okay, go ahead, though. And I think that's a, the key to that approach is that we have to be tolerant of risk. That would be a tolerant of failure. Um, the, uh, the answer is that we know that there's a trade between commercial and the conventional way that NASA does business, and it's not one or the other. It's a mix of both, and so that's a tough, that's a tough balancing act. And we also know that money is a key ingredient, and we also know that there's a tight fiscal budget. So, you know, what we're looking for is, is how do we get to the next level of detail in order to accomplish and balance these key ingredients. Okay. Timmy, the gentleman back there wants to say something. Uh, Bob Scrimmage from Mainstream Engineering. I was just going to say something that's a little bit different. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, PhD in mechanical engineering, I've been in this field my whole life. Uh, one of the problems that you have is the red tape is unbelievable. I mean, you have a shuttle that's flying that's using technology that's antiquated because there's so much red tape to change that technology that you never do. So the astronaut has a personal computer that's 10 times faster than the, the computer that's doing the, the, the calculations on board. So you can't underestimate that tremendous amount of inertia that's there. And from a private enterprise like I am, I, I tell you the way to do it is to move towards private enterprise. Move towards prizes, as you talked about, move private enterprise, put NASA in a role where they are more oversight and maintaining sort of that kind of position to make sure that safety checks like that are being done, but not doing the engineering and not overseeing the engineering every every step of the way, but just the safety checks, the quality checks, those kinds of things. So really streamlining NASA, letting private enterprise do it. And I will okay. tell you, if we go at the pace we're going now, the Chinese who are much far behind are going to be ahead of us because they are moving on a fast pace and the Indians are moving on a fast pace. And we're sitting here with lots of false starts, as the astronaut said. And that demoralizes people, too, because you spend... You know, engineers get excited about a project, they put their heart and soul in it, cancels, put your heart and soul in this one, cancels, put your heart and soul in this one, and then at some point you say, what are we doing here, you know? So consistency is important, and get rid of red tape, is, 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 but do not underestimate the amount of red tape that, that is in this program. Tim, please. <coughs> My name is Tim Hughes, I'm a general counsel at Space Exploration Technology, SpaceX. We're a company that was founded in 2002 by a serial entrepreneur named Elon Musk. I think you've made his acquaintance in the past. Um, Elon has a vision much like your own. He wants to make humanity a space-faring civilization. He wants to do it expeditiously, and he wants to do it with ruthless and uh, uh, rapid efficiency. Uh, and to that end, over the past uh, seven years, we've been working with NASA uh, to, uh, to design and manufacture uh, a Falcon 9 launch vehicle, uh, and a Dragon spacecraft. And last year, we became the first private entity ever to successfully re-enter a spacecraft. And in just a few weeks' time, we'll become the first entity 
uh, we believe, to successfully berth with the, the space station, first private entity, that is. We did all of this uh, in a, on a pace that is unforeseen uh, or has never been seen in the space industry, and we did it for price points that were unheard of. Our Falcon 9 booster uh, uh, cost about $300 million to develop from scratch. Our Dragon spacecraft costs about $300 million to develop from scratch. All told, my company has spent less than $1 billion in the aggregate, and we've yielded a new American booster and a new American capsule. We have seen a nimble NASA. Uh, you spoke in your speech about the importance of a nimble NASA, and, and here we have seen that. We've worked hand in glove with NASA, but we've done it in, in a commercial context. And there's a lot of talk, I think, about what it means to be commercial. And my definition of commercial, I think SpaceX's definition of commercial, is firm fixed price contracts, getting paid only per, for performance, which is a bit of a novelty sometimes in the aerospace industry, uh, having customers other than the U.S. government, uh, having paquet, uh, competitive procurements, which are not sole source to incumbents, <clears throat> and also inviting private investment, in fact, in some cases requiring private investment. We're more than willing to do that. We have done, done that to date. If I could leave you with three things that I think are important uh, in the very near term. Eliminate reliance on, on the Russians as expeditiously as possible for manned carriage. Super important. The prices of, of, of launch that we're, we're purchasing from the Russians are going up year by year. The Russians have turned into fabulous capitalists. Second, contracting reform, also critical. Review existing contracts and cut the fat. Firm fixed price contracts rather than cost plus contracting. Generate true cost accounting so the government actually understands what it's paying for these launches. And when a procurement is laid out, provide the requirements and let commercial companies work against true requirements from the beginning so that there isn't shifting over time with unknown costs associated with that. And the third thing is, is just genuine competition, both for NASA launches and uh, U.S. Air Force launches. There isn't genuine competition uh, to date uh, on the Air Force side of the ledger, and we'd very much like to see that going forward. We think it'll drive down costs, drive up efficiency, and we can get all this done, we believe, in the next three years, for manned carriage at least. Adrian? Um, uh, go ahead. If I could just make a couple of points. Um, Mark Bitterman, United Launch Alliance. Um, Mr. Speaker, just to pick up on the question that, that you were asking about how quickly companies could be ready. I think the problem really is political. We've seen that uh, over the last decade. Um, I have a, a rocket model in my cabinet at home, which is a Delta IV with a space taxi on the front end. Um, if, we had, if, if we had followed through, if the executive branch had followed through uh, a decade ago, uh, there's no question that we would be launching perhaps uh, on Delta IVs, at Delta IV heavies, and Atlas Vs today. So it's political will. Uh, we don't have a space policy today um, uh, with any degree of consistency, nor do we have in the Congress any champions for space. What we have today are not people like, like you and Bob Walker uh, were many years ago. Uh, what we have is people who protect their centers at all costs, and I understand why they would do that. But the visionaries, uh, few and far between. Thanks, Adrian. Mr. Speaker, my name is Adrian Lafitte. I work for Lockheed Martin, and we're the one producing the Orion multipurpose crew vehicle. And in spite of two presidents, three administrators, and numerous changes in Congress, we had a team that remained focused, and I'm proud to say that we are now in the production state, working towards doing the first exploration flight test in 2014 of the Orion uh, system. And I think what would have made our life a little bit e easier is sort of like what Mike was saying, if we can have a vision that can survive all the changes that occur that are normal, we would have been able to do our product more efficiently and in a more timely manner. But when you get you start and stop and things change it, it makes really hard for us to go continue and have the continuity that's required to produce a quality product. Thanks, Adrian. Dr. Cantonese. Great to see you again. Tony Cantonese, President of Florida Institute of Technology, the only tier one private university, uh, technological university in the South. We met when I was a young assistant professor at Georgia Tech, and you were assistant professor of history at 
West Georgia College. And I remember we talked about long-range planning, and I was so impressed with that. And we talked about space, even in those days, because that's when space exploration was real. And um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, aerospace education, as you would expect. Uh, I'm worried. Uh, I'm worried we're falling behind in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, which is no surprise to anybody in this room. And um, when I talk to high school kids, they say it's too hard. It's too hard to study these things. Uh, I spend some time in China, and I see an entirely different culture there where this is valued, and the central communist government directs kids to study these STEM courses. And then they send them here uh, to study, and that's, that's fine. Uh, in India, I see STEM courses, STEM education as part of their culture, that they believe uh, so much in the importance of this. And I think we're falling behind. And uh, I think, uh, I remember back when I was a kid, you, you mentioned uh, Kennedy's talk uh, and his inspiration. Uh, I remember even back to President Eisenhower when Sputnik went up in 57. And uh, President Eisenhower said, boys and girls, I want you to study science and engineering because we've got to beat the Russians in space. And we did. We did what the president said in those days. And then, of course, the National Defense Education Act. <coughs> and sometimes we forget the importance of defense in higher education. <coughs> so I guess my only point is that I think um, the president of the United States is the one who really has to develop this inspiration. I love your ideas of uh, lunar colonization, of, of, of getting to Mars. And A little bit of a different approach, a uh, little bit of a different angle on the subject. Uh, we're a private, com uh, publicly traded company. More than 50 percent of our share is traded on the New York Stock Exchange here. We're a Brazilian-based company with our headquarters here in the United States in Fort Lauderdale. We've been here 33 years in this country. We employ over 1,000. Ember makes aircraft both in the commercial, uh, executive jet, and defense sectors. Um, three years ago, we made a decision to, uh, to move uh, uh, and, and establish a line in the United States for executive jets. It's our Phenom family of aircraft. And uh, of all the places in the United States where we could have put this facility, and believe me, we did a very adequate and thorough search, we decided on Brevard County here and in Melbourne in particular here at the airport. And there was a number of reasons uh, for that. Obviously, the business climate here in the state of Florida is, is robust. We know it well being in Fort Lauderdale. But also, uh, one of the main pillars was the availability of a quality workforce. And what we have found here uh, in creating 200 very high-quality jobs here, actually insourcing jobs into the United States, um, is, um, was, was phenomenal. I mean, uh, more than a third of the workforce that we have right now comes from those that have been affected by the retirement of the space shuttle, uh, those that were working on the, uh, the recovery of the solid rocket boosters, Captain, those that were working on s space shuttle launch missions are now working in integral and important positions on the line. And this speaks very well for the quality of the workforce and the preservation of this workforce and the contributions that they're making not only to the public sector but the private sector are very important. And I think um, I, I like to thank you for inviting me here to at least give our perspective on the subject because it is a different approach and the private sector certainly has benefited by the capacity and the capabilities that are here. Well, thanks so much, Gary. Uh, one of the greatest prizes or prides uh, we have here in the Space Coast, Mr. Speaker, is our workforce. We have uh, one of the highest concentrations of engineers. But beyond the technical capabilities of our workforce, we have a resilient workforce. We have a dedicated workforce. We have a willing workforce. And we've invited uh, uh, the Honorable Andy Anderson, one of our county commissioners, here to talk a little bit about workforce with you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honor to be able to speak to you today. Um, as uh, uh, Mr. Whalen, Whalen led in, we have an unbelievable uh, uh, amount of talent in the Space Coast, probably unlike most places in the United States. And not only do these individuals work on human space flight, as been mentioned before, but of course, as you know, uh, defense is a big deal. And uh, as we all know, for a strong national defense, space is going to be the place to be. As a, a person who represents many of those companies in this district, I am very concerned about the current mission, administration's cuts to defense and what that will translate on into uh, the, the workforce 
and the uh, uh, aerospace industries that we have locally. Uh, these citizens work very hard and believe very much in what they do, and they believe that part of a strong national defense is space. Um, I appreciate your support in the past. You spoke pretty eloquently about it during the debates on uh, funding our defense. But for a local elected official who loses sleep about jobs, it goes beyond that. And these, uh, uh, your continued support is greatly appreciated. So when people think about space, it's just not astronauts, no, no offense, <laughs> Captain, but it's also those, uh, those other things that uh, keep us safe in this nation. Bill? Speaker, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today. My name is Bill Cunningham. I'm the past chair of the Local Economic Development Commission, and I'm with an organization called SEPTIS. Now, we're a new organization, and unlike my friends in the space industry, we do something different. We're about ready to launch a new online payment system that as is, is, uh, mobilizes the value of gold to make electronic fund transfers online. Now, when we're successful, that's going to bring, we believe, a large economic benefit back to the county and hopefully to the state of Florida. What we really represent, though, relative to the people in this room, is a very focused effort on the Space Coast to build on that legacy of technology, innovation, and achievement that my colleagues at the table have created and continue to create so that we can diversify the economy locally and so that we can expand on that economy. You've heard a couple comments about, about how good the workforce is. I'm not sure the world knows that there is a higher concentration of engineers in Brevard County than any other city in the United States, or that our MSA was deemed by Forbes uh, a year ago to be the 11th most innovative uh, community in the United States. Uh, I think we have that legacy. It's something we can build on. Uh, often in initiatives, we look at big things, grandiose things. We talk about large projects. I think it's extraordinarily important, though, to also focus on how we spur those entrepreneurs, how we spur the innovation, how we take the grand things in front of us and build something even bigger upon it to make our economy go faster and create what I'll call almost the hidden jobs that we bring forth in the economy. Certainly, we appreciate any comment you have there and your support for folks like us as we move forward. Let me just mention, if you haven't looked at it, there's a book called Regional Advantage by Saxanian who is a sociologist at Berkeley, which is a study of Silicon Valley in 128 and why Silicon Valley had huge cultural advantages in accelerating the tempo of collective innovation. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting book, and it's called, I'm pretty sure it's called Regional Advantage. Saxanian is S-A-C-H-E-N-S-I-A-N, -I, -I, I think. Thanks, Bill. This community, um, I've uh, been following you for decades back when you were a fiery backbencher, and even back then you were eloquent and compelling in supporting space and for that. And we thank you. You've, you've always done that. Um, and the vision you've laid forward is clearly bold and, and grandiose and, and inspiring. Um, but I guess the question that this community has is this president put forward an attempt to remake the NASA uh, and remake American Space Program. Uh, and, you know, you, you offered some support for that. Um, however, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, having been speaker, the, the president proposes, but how can you help us understand how you're going to convince the people who appropriate the funds and allow that to happen? Because there's a lot of powerful people in Congress who genuinely think they're representing the interests of their district and they're, they're strong-willed. And uh, how are you going to convince, you know, Barbara Mikulski or the Dark Lord of Alabama or Chairman Hall or, or somebody, a lot of powerful people up there, and, and absent their coming along with you, we're going to find ourselves back where we are right now. Does that make sense? Sure. The, um there's a book called The Education of Ronald Reagan, which is a study of his years at General Electric. He spent eight years. He gave, uh, I think, 375 speeches. And he worked for a guy who was the vice president for employee relations uh, named uh, Lemuel Bulwar. 
And Bulwar's model, he had seven unions, two of which were communist. And his model was that if you could move the opinion of the union members, they would constrain the leaders. And so he designed the most elaborate communication system of any corporation. And he brought in Reagan to be the articulator in a positive, happy, friendly way. And in that eight-year period, Reagan learned the way Bulwar thought. Uh, I read this book in uh, 2008. And although I had first met Reagan in 1974 to talk about communications, I, it changed my understanding of what he did. The President of the United States, strong presidents, don't actually negotiate with Congress. Strong presidents work with the American people, and the American people negotiate with Congress. And Reagan captured it by saying that his job was to show the light to the American people so they could turn up the heat on Congress. The reason you have to have a bold, large vision is you, you don't arouse the American nation with trivial, bureaucratically rational objectives. And then you get down to a question. Do you want to be part of the generation that gets to the moon and Mars? Or do you want to have pork? And everybody wants to have pork, you're on that side of the room. And everybody who wants to get to the moon and Mars and be part of America's future, you're on this side of the room. You know, sometimes you have to beat people. And you say, you know, I know you're chairman, and I've got more votes than you do. And you know, there's probably, I, sus I suspect, we'll see how it works out if I win, but I suspect that having been speaker and having served in the House for 20 years, I have a reasonable level of understanding of how to move the institutions. It's also a question of picking the fights. I mean, I need to figure out, this is where you all matter and, and uh, where Senator Altman will matter, I need to figure out which fights, if I win them, unlock the mechanisms so that you get to a different world. I can't afford to win tactically one fight at a time. So I've got to figure out what are the strategic fights as a consequence of which the, the tempo and the rhythm change. Now, if we can do that, that will be very exhilarating. You know, We'll see. I think it can be done. I think the American people would thrill at being, at it being done. And I'm prepared to invest the prestige of the presidency in communicating and building a nationwide movement in favor of space. Then that movement's going to have to go out and convince the local elected officials at town hall meetings. And if we do it right, um, it'll be wild. I mean, it'll just be the most fun you've ever seen. And unfortunately, uh, my campaign manager is about to lose his mind because we're running late and we have to go to another event. Thank you, I sir. thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. This has been very, very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. history has shown that that, that that schedule will slip, and people know that. Uh, the change in policy, like Mike just said, when we come up with another change in policy, we know that that is going to result in another slip. Uh, it doesn't get through Congress quickly. But, but can I but just cut you off a second? Five years from now is the schedule you think will slip. So my question would be, if we cut through all the red tape, how fast could we do it if we were serious? I, I think uh, there's, there's two things about that. I mean, your, your, your statement about cutting through the red tape, that's, a, that's, a not, that's one of the balancing acts. And that was uh, actually my next point. Human spaceflight is, is risky. It's, um, Running late 
And I thank you. I thank President Ritchie for being very flexible and flipped the two, the two events. But I appreciate very much you all being patient. Uh, it's a little bit the nature of presidential campaigns that they get out of control and you find yourself running around. Uh, so I, I just wanted to hear from all of you. You've got a very impressive group here. And so just, you know, tell me what you wish I knew. Mr. Speaker, I just want to introduce uh, Captain Mike McCauley, a former NASA astronaut, who's going to give you his take on where we're sitting in terms of uh, space today. I think it's about a 30-second speech. Uh, we're, we're a nation of leaders and explorers, always have been. And in the last few years, in my opinion, we've largely given up our leadership role in uh, human spaceflight. George Bush, in January of 04, eight years ago this month, gave a pretty damn good speech on a new vision and a new mission for the agency. Two presidents, three NASA administrators, several OMBs, a bunch of Congress, and a bunch of program managers later, we don't have a whole lot to show for it in eight years. We need consistent, steady leadership, aggressive leadership, which you've shown that you will bring to us, and uh, that's it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us your time and uh, charge on. Did the, did the mission I outlined make sense? Uh, yes, although I'd argue with you on a few things here and there, but, but it's details. Uh, the vision is more important and the steadiness because, again, um, President Bush gave a good speech, but nobody followed up on it. And, again, three administrators, two presidents, and a bunch of OMBs later, We've had been down spiral development. We've been down constellation. Now we're down something else, and we had something else before that that I don't even remember. So it's been three or four major programs that have consumed enormous amounts of energy and money and time, and here we sit eight years later without a hell of a lot to show for it. I can say that now that I'm retired, of course. <laughs> Mark, please. Uh, good evening, and thanks for coming to Florida to share your vision. My name is Mark Nappy. I represent the United Space Alliance and also the majority of the workforce that, it, that have lost their jobs due to this transition. And uh, I think you conveyed a very good long-term vision. And, and following Mike, uh, what I'd like to do is kind of focus on the short term and some of the more, the next level of detail that this, this uh, Space Coast, the people of the Space Coast, and certainly the workforce of the Space Coast are going to be interested in. Um, there's, a, there's a real balance that, that has to be achieved, and what I'd like to kind of throw out there for you and see if I can get your opinion on, or, or maybe you can just think about it, is, uh, is how, do you, how do you reach the proper balance in terms of these elements? The first thing is any, any schedule that gets published we know is going to get pushed to the right. Right now we're looking at returning to flight, putting people back into space by 2017, and it's, it's hard and it's dangerous. And so you have to balance that risk. And, and where we, we talk about NASA's involvement, NASA adds value to reducing that risk. The problem is they also add inefficiencies where risk is not reduced. So you've got to figure out how do you get NASA to add value, reduce that risk, characterize that risk properly so that if an accident or something does happen, you mentioned in your speech that we have to be tolerant to accidents. Well, this country is not tolerant to accidents. So we, we go beyond perfection to make sure that that doesn't happen because we know that if a mishap occurs, it means another delay and maybe a cancellation. So, and I didn't answer your question very well, but we have to balance that. Well, that let me, I don't want to be argumentative, but I just want to understand. So, so let, let me take a radical example. If we decided to human rate the Atlas V, how long would that take? I think I would 